Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Hart Beatty. Uh, I am the chair of the Education Committee for the APDR, and I am unbelievably excited to kick off our APDR National Virtual Noon Conference today with two amazing speakers, internationally known, um, and lecturing on the uh, COVID-19 virus. Uh, just a couple housekeeping items for everybody. Um, this webinar, uh, as you can see here on the left of this first slide, and all questions are being recorded. Comments will be recorded also. So not only uh, the video and the speakers, but any comments or questions that you submit as attendees are being uh, recorded, so you should know that. Uh, we are muting your microphones uh, to make sure the optimum quality for the participants. Having said that, um, if you do have questions, we ask you to use the Q&A tool uh, for the Zoom platform, not the chat tool. Please use the Q&A tool for any questions you might have. Introduce uh, our speakers for today. Uh, we're gonna reverse the order a little bit here. Dr. Jeff Caney uh, is gonna be speaking first from uh, University of Wisconsin, followed by Dr. Kazaruni from the University of Michigan. Uh, before Dr. Caney gets started, I would just like to thank you so much for your dedication uh, towards this program and towards resident education uh, we can't uh, tell you how much we appreciate that. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over the slide deck to Dr. Caney. I'll stop sharing my slide and uh, start sharing uh, Dr. Caney's slides. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone, or afternoon, depending on where you are. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Ella was going to go first, um, but I'm going to go ahead and start today. So we're going to jump a little ahead, and I'm going to talk about the imaging findings of COVID-19. So I like to start with this slide, and for those of you who've seen my STR lecture, I have changed the cases, so they're not the same images, but just think about it for a second, which of the patient has COVID-19, and we'll come back to this at the end of my talk. So I gave a lecture about a month ago at the Society of Thoracic Radiology's meeting, and this is what the, the world looked like at that time. There were 114,000 and change cases worldwide, uh, and about 4,000 deaths, most of which were in China. If we look now, this was as of uh, midnight uh, Pacific time. We're now to 1.3 million and of almost 76,000 deaths. And you can see there's a lot more red dots on your screen. This was the US back in March when I gave my first talk. We had a smattering of cases there and you can see the big cities, were, especially on the coast, we're starting to see a lot more uh, cases. And here we are now. Jeff, um, yep. I'm sorry to interrupt. We're having, uh, it, it looks like we're not sharing your slide yet. Oh. If you could pull that and maybe. My apologies. There. There we are. We got okay. that. And if you could just press the present. There we are. Now we're good. Okay. All Thank right. you. All right. So here's the slide here. Which one is COVID-19? We'll come back to that. This is where we were a week, month ago, as I mentioned. We've jumped ahead now so there's where we were a month ago in the u.s and here's where we are now so a lot more cases of covid 19 almost i bet many of you watching have probably seen a case or two or maybe many many more depending on where you are so i'm going to define the role of imaging illustrate the imaging findings and apply the uh, recently published rsna str and acr suggested recording language for ct but i also show some radiographic images so this is the definition for the diagnosis of COVID-19 from the World Health Organization. And it's important to recognize that imaging is not part of the diagnosis. And we're, different institutions are using imaging differently, but it's primarily based on proving it through PCR. And of course, now we have a lot more available testing than we did a month ago um, across the world and uh, with even rapid tests coming online uh, in some places already and hopefully uh, more widespread in the coming days and weeks where we can get a five minute turnaround uh, or 15 minute turnaround as opposed to four hours or even longer. Uh, this is from a paper in radiology that was published back in February. And um, this is important to remember, uh, this quote here, these reports confirm that a normal chest CT scan cannot exclude the diagnosis of COVID-19, especially, I'm paraphrasing here, uh, for patients with early onset sy symptoms. So depending on when you scan, it's gonna have a lot of inf uh, impact on what the imaging is going to look like. And mostly in the United States, we're not using chest CT. In China, they did uh, many CT scans in patients early uh, throughout, the scan, uh, throughout their hospital stay and at discharge. 
whereas uh, we're using it very sparingly at most institutions, if at all, and uh, we're not doing serial imaging in, in the majority of our patients. And just most importantly, the final diagnosis of COVID-19 should be confirmed by a positive RT-PCR test or gene sequencing. So just keep that in mind when interpreting these and if you're consulting with somebody about the results of an imaging test. Now, radiographs are, there's some good things and some bad things about them. They're relatively inexpensive. And if you're in a busy emergency department, they can be done quickly. They can be done portably so you can keep the patients isolated or limit where the uh, suspected cases are. And it's easy to clean up. You can uh, you know, clean the detectors, you can wipe down the machine, uh, single technologists can do it a team, and you can minimize the use of uh, personal protective equipment. Now, the downsides to radiographs, of course, is their low sensitivity and low specificity. And if any of you saw on CNN, uh, it's made the Twitter sphere today, uh, was it Chris Cuomo's uh, radiograph they were showing, talking about the abnormalities? Well, the most of us in the chess world took one look and said it was normal. And he's a proven, he's said he's a proven case of COVID-19. So not, not great sensitivity or specificity. So, you know, if you see something on the radiographic, it may be helpful, but not always. But let's look at a few cases here. So these are cases of COVID-19. Um, and you can see in this particular radiograph that we have a underinflated lungs, but there's these rounded opacities in the periphery of the lungs. They can be very subtle. Um, but they're too, these are too large just to be vessels out there. And, and you can imagine the CT correlate's gonna be probably ground glass opacity with some consolidation because it's pretty hard to see ground glass opacity on a radiograph. Here's another example with a little bit more exuberant disease. And these are the typical findings you'll see more peripheral, often basal predominant. And this corresponds to an organizing pneumonia pattern of lung injury. So here you can see in the periphery of both lungs this peripheral and basal predominant uh, sort of patchy consolidation there. Notice the absence of pleural fusion. That's a very common feature with many viral infections, including COVID-19. This was a little bit more unusual case, and this was uh, one of the few done on one of our clinics, but you can see this patient presented with almost sort of a mid-zone predominant uh, two areas of consolidation, one on each side. And then if you look on the ladder, you can see some was anterior and some was posterior, but still um, sort of has that bilateral nature. Notice the lack of pleural effusion. And although the sensitivity is low on C, uh, radiographs for lymphadenopathy, you'll notice the hyla look fairly normal on the lateral radiograph. And this is just a more advanced case here. We see exquisite uh, peripheral consolidation, almost looks like chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. This one sort of spared the, the, the costophrenic sulci for whatever reason, but uh, this pattern can be seen again with COVID-19, but influenza, human metanumovirus, drug reaction, and connective tissues, these can look exactly like this. So the clinical context is very important. You have to know the pretest probability, which we don't always have a number, but you can just look at your, your state, your county, and how many cases are floating around and have a sense of what's going on. Is it, is it if you're in New York City, the pretest probability is probably very high. If you're in parts of Alaska, it's probably more likely something else. So location, location. Here's another one. This was a little bit more unusual. This is more central and perihilar. Um, would be a good look for aspiration, but with the classic fe features of a cough, fever, shortness of breath, you have to at least consider uh, infection, including viral. And that's how I typically have been reporting these and not specifically saying COVID-19, just saying infection, including viral. This is another case here. This one's a little uh, more unusual that it's strikingly peribronchial or perihilar, and there may even be a left pleural effusion, but this was another COVID-19 case. But you'll notice all the cases I've shown so far have shown bilateral lung disease, and that's been shown in almost all patients, particularly after a few days of symptoms, and so uh, and that's when many of them present for uh, medical care. Now, this one was, was more unilateral. It's a little more unusual, but fairly extensive lung disease on the left. There probably was some on the right that you could see on a CT scan, but it wasn't apparent on this radiograph. And then just finally, a more diffuse case here, we can see very hypoinflated lungs, lots of patchy white stuff, almost has a nodular configuration to it as well. And that has also been described more on CT, but these are little areas of organizing pneumonia that we're seeing just superimposed on each other. And then finally, this patient tested positive for COVID-19, and a normal radiograph does not exclude COVID-19, so keep that in mind. Uh, so when I'm asked specifically in reporting these, you know, question in, you know, COVID-19, and we have a little workflow at our hospital that I kind of know they're already thinking about that, I do put that caveat in the report 
because uh, I don't know who's necessarily reading them. As our emergency physicians are, are, are pretty aware of this, but uh, people out in the community practice may be less aware. So just keep that in mind. A normal radiograph does not exclude the diagnosis and PCR testing must be done. Now, what about CT? Well, CT has pros and cons. It's um, a lot more sensitive. Um, the sensitivity has been reported to be quite high in the literature uh, in the high 90s. Now, of course, it depends on the prevalence of the disease and uh, when you scan. It's a lot more specific, but the specificity is still rather, rather low. Um, you know, in the mid 50s, 40s, it depends on what series you read, uh, and it depends on what else is going on uh, in the environment. Uh, back in March, we had a lot of flu here in Madison, Wisconsin. We still have a fair amount, but it's starting to taper off. Um, so I was still more likely to encounter a case of influenza than I was COVID-19. Um, other parts of the world, it's probably changed a lot. It depends on how many uh, patients you have on immunotherapy. If you're seeing a lot of patients on immunotherapy, you're probably going to see a lot of drug reaction. So you have to keep that in mind. And I think one of the big advantages of CT is it does offer an alternative diagnosis, primarily pulmonary embolism, um, which uh, you can see in both patients without COVID-19, um, which anecdotally a lot of people are seeing lately and uh, it's unclear why, or if it's just purely just a bias because we're doing fewer CT angios. Um, but it's, it's been also shown that there seems to be an increase of thromboembolic events in patients with COVID-19. So uh, we may be CTing them for that reason. But, Typically, we're not using CT to screen for COVID-19. Uh, we're limiting it to portable radiographs. The cons, of course, is CT is relatively expensive by about an order of magnitude. The exam time is longer, uh, so you can't image as many patients. So in a busy emergency department, it's really not practical. You have to transport patients in a lot of places. Uh, and not all emergency departments have a CT scanner right there, or they may be uh, down a hallway, or you can't do it in the patient care room. And then of course, uh, cleanup, uh, most of these are on droplet precautions. So you have to wipe down a lot more equipment, let the air circulate out a little bit. So it takes longer to turn over the room for the next patient. Um, I was part of this group uh, that uh, we did this expert consensus on COVID-19 reporting uh, to create some standardized language to help guide uh, radiologists in how to report uh, cases of uh, CTs in particular, of cases of known or suspected COVID-19. Um, and it was primarily targeted towards the incidental finding. Say, example, you're looking at a spine CT or an abdominal CT, and you see features in the image portions of the lungs that very well could, could reflect COVID-19. How to address that? And uh, we gave some terminology. And I'll go through, uh, this was the table included in there, and I'll go through the different categories. But more importantly, I'm going to show you examples that fall into these different categories. This is available on the RSNA's website. Um, if you're interested in using it or reading it over. And just, uh, they also included some standard um, abbreviations for data mining if you're interested in that as well, but I won't talk about the data mining. So let's start with the typical appearance, and that is a bilateral, um, predominantly ground glass opacities uh, with or without consolidation. And it has been shown is that as this, uh, the organizing lung injury progresses, you start to see more and more consolidation as you fill more and more alveoli with um, the uh, organization, the collagen, and, and then the other inflammation. And some patients would also have a crazy paving appearance as well. And I'll give you some examples of this. It's typically peripheral. Some of the opacities may be rounded and you may see a reversed halo sign. So with this first example here, we see these peripheral areas of ground glass opacity. The one in the right lower lobe has a little bit of a solid component to it, but it's predominantly ground glass and it's bilateral. And, uh, and a shout out to Mike Chung at uh, Mount Sinai in New York. He shared a lot of cases with me. Uh, and of course, they're seeing a lot of cases in New York right now. Here's another example of the so-called typical appearance. We have bilateral ground glass opacity. And I do wanna point out, you can see the, the peripheral arcading where you see these spared peripheral lobules. This is not uncommon to see in, in patterns of organizing pneumonia, not just from infection, but also from drug toxicity. So when I see discrete areas of ground glass opacity that adhere to the lobular architecture and often outline other lobules uh, or, or spared lobules, I think very strongly of an organizing pneumonia pattern. And in this setting, of course, with COVID-19, that would be in the differential diagnosis. This case shows a basilar predominant ground glass opacity. It is asymmetric, but involves both lower lobes um, and both lungs. And you can see on the right, we have a lot more peripheral ground glass opacity. Some of it is more confluent in the anterior basal right lower lobe, whereas other portions of it are more rounded or nodular in the, in the basal middle lobe, as well as the uh, mid portion of the left lower lobe. 
and then you have perfectly normal lung admixed in there. Again, note the absence of pleural effusion, not a commonly reported finding. So if you do have pleural effusions, you have to think about other things or you have two things going on. And the pleural effusions are often seen more commonly with bacterial infections um, and possibly drug reactions or of course superimposed heart failure. But it doesn't exclude the diagnosis of COVID-19, but at least suggests an alternative diagnosis or a, a second diagnosis. This is one of my cases here, and you can see it's, it's asymmetric but bilateral, and the, the ground glass is becoming a little denser, and we're starting to see areas of consolidation around it. Uh, the right upper lobe arrow points to one rounded opacity. It sort of has a denser rim. It's not the best example of a reversed halo. I'll show you a better one, but it's at least thinking about becoming a reversed halo. And then in the left upper lobe, you have this nice peripheral band, or more like a large area of ground glass admixed with consolidation. And just remember ground glass opacity and consolidation are really a continuum of increasing lung density. So it's not, it's, it's, it makes sense that they will coexist because it's just a spectrum of how much filling of the lung you're doing or how much air you're displacing. And then this is one of the more classic appearances here with the peripheral opacities, in this case, predominantly consolidation uh, in the lower lobes and posteriorly located that was described in some of the earlier papers. But any of these cases I've shown so far are very typical appearances of organizing pneumonia and uh, are, are commonly reported uh, findings of COVID-19, as well as influenza. And these findings were also seen during the SARS outbreak of 2002, 2003, and even in the MERS outbreak that came in 2012 and those cases that occasionally trickle in. So it's not exclusive. And if you still have a lot of influenza in your area, you need to keep that in mind as well. Luckily, most emergency departments and clinics can test for uh, uh, influenza A and B and RSV rather quickly. So those results are usually back before the COVID-19 results are. And in this case, just another one showing some of these rounded opacities uh, in, in the left lower lobe and then some ground glass in the middle lobe there. So just one, another example of the typical appearance. So there we go. Um, and then this uh, right here, just the nodular component. So this was also described, and this nodular component was described uh, actually very early on in cases, uh, patients who only had a few days of symptoms. Uh, less likely we're going to encounter these in the U.S. as we're not doing CTs in the majority of them, or patients may wait till they're, 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 they're sicker to, uh, to present. And then uh, this reverse halo sign here in the left upper lobe uh, is a case that Mike shared with me here, so another finding organizing pneumonia. So this is the language in the uh, RSNA guidelines or recommendations. Commonly reported imaging features of COVID-19 pneumonia are present but we mentioned the other things such as specifically called the influenza, other causes of organizing pneumonia. So um, when you see this, you can use this language. Um, if the history is, sounds like it's a good fit, you could say it's consistent with infection, including viral, um, or you can specifically mention COVID-19. And that's gonna be up to individual practices and individual institutions, how they wanna um, address that, given that patients do have access to the reports and there may be varying um, guidelines of who gets tested. And you don't want to put someone in a situation where they feel boxed in to test somebody or a patient demands testing because they see COVID-19 in their report, even though the clinical picture may not fit. Now let's talk about the indeterminate appearance. And the indeterminate appearance is, uh, so it doesn't have the typical appearance, the findings that I already went over. It can be bilateral or unilateral, can consist of ground glass opacity or, and or consolidation. But the important things is there's no specific distribution. So it may be diffuse, it may be more central, um, or it's sort of, um, you can't really make it peripheral predominant or basal predominant. The opacities may not be rounded, or you may just have a very few uh, number of small ground glass opacities. So this was one case I saw, and you can see we have a much more extensive abnormality, lots of ground glass opacity. I will draw your attention to, to this peripheral abnormality though, that it is, still has that sort of arcading look to it, spared lobules, this perilobular appearance. There is normal lung admixed in there. And then down in the left lower lobe, you can see that arcading as well, but much more extensive lung disease. And as you can imagine, these patients are typically more symptomatic and are sort of either farther along in their course of their disease or have a more severe response to the infection. This is another case here where the distribution is not as quite peripheral. You see a lot of uh, peribronchial consolidation in the right upper lobe, a lot of peribronchial ground glass opacity in the left upper lobe, and the 
the, at least the upper portion of the right lower lobe is pretty diffusely involved here. You just see a little bit of sparing. So it's sort of a sort of has some of the typical features, but not enough to say it's just the classic appearance of that. So another indeterminate appearance. And then this is a patient who just had these, just a few of these very small peripheral ground glass opacities. So this is typically seen again in a patient just presenting uh, early on in the course of disease. And many of these cases uh, came from China where patients were scanned with minimal or no, no symptoms, even with just exposures. So uh, less likely to encounter a case like this in the United States, unless they come in with chest pain or something and it's uh, unrelated and we're picking up an early um, COVID-19. This was an unusual case I saw that presented with just this opacity in the right lower lobe, but you can see it's a nice area of ground glass opacity. Uh, a good example of the black bronchus sign, where you see a nice black bronchus outlined by the ground glass, brings, makes it more conspicuous. So unilateral with no, just in a single location would also be considered indeterminate. So uh, the, the suggested verbiage is imaging features can be seen with COVID-19 and that are not specific um, and concur can occur with other infectious processes. And then our third category was atypical, and this is just uh, things that really don't fit with what's been published in the literature, but it doesn't exclude the diagnosis. And things you wanna think about are is, you know, isolated low bar segmental consolidation without ground glass opacity, your typical um, you know, low bar pneumonia type thing, small nodules like tree and bud or central lobular nodules suggesting a bronchiolitis that has not been described as a manifestation of COVID-19, cavities, and then septal thickening and pleural fusion suggesting edema. And in this case shared with me, you can see we have this large area of consolidation in the right upper lobe, and that's the only abnormality there. If, if you saw this any other day, you'd say this is your typical community acquired bacterial pneumonia and not a, your typical virus infection. There. This was an interesting case as well as this patient had tested positive PCR COVID-19, but had tree and bud uh, in several lobes, I pointed out here in the middle lobe, but also a lot of endobronchial debris. This patient also was a known uh, traumatic brain injury sufferer and was a chronic aspirator. So what we're seeing is probably aspiration and the patient happened to just test positive for COVID-19, but didn't have the, the lung involvement that had been described. So just because the PCR is positive doesn't mean you need to make the imaging findings fit the diagnosis. You can have two things going. And then this was a case I had as well, where you see the, the peripheral ground glass opacity fits, but then there was this cluster of tree and bud nodules in the right upper lobe, uh, posteriorly with the yellow arrow. And then there's a subtle ground glass opacity anteriorly on the left. Now you will notice this patient has a gastric tube in, you can see the little metal artifact between the trachea and the aorta. And so this patient probably aspirated from having that NG tube in or feeding tube in, and then that's what caused the tree and bud. So still has an atypical appearance though. And then this is a case that's not COVID-19, but rather hantavirus pulmonary syndrome. But just to illustrate a point here, you can have peripheral and patchy nodular ground glass opacity, but note this patient has some septal lines, not a lot of them, but you can see a few of them. I put an arrow in the middle lobe. You can see two nicely outlined nodules and then uh, small layering pleural effusions uh, with the asterisk there. So um, it suggests pulmonary edema pattern, but uh, hantavirus can do this. It's probably the only virus that does. So just atypical features. So the verbiage is, is uh, imaging features are atypical or uncommonly reported for COVID-19 pneumonia, and you should consider an alternative diagnosis. Now, having said that, of course, if there's a clinical suspicion, PCR testing should be done. And then finally, negative for pneumonia. Doesn't mean they don't have COVID-19, it just means they don't have uh, a host response or abnormalities in their lung. Pretty straightforward. Now, just quickly about timing, uh, and this was from Mike Chung and Adam Bernheim's group in, at, at Mount Sinai in New York, and they looked at uh, the timing of the findings, and you can see uh, earlier on, majority of patients have normal CT, and as time passes up to 12 days, you start seeing um, more and more consolidation, more and more bilateral disease, and more a stronger peripheral distribution. And the linear opacities, which is probably what's left as this starts to clear, show up around uh, later on about two weeks out. So just uh, again, in China, they were scanning early and frequently. Uh, many patients had three or four CTs. In the US, uh, we're not scanning much. And if we are, it's maybe a presentation for a different reason or if we're suspecting a complication. Uh, just to show here, uh, just change this with these scans were four days apart. 
and you can see the rapid progression from sort of a patchy appearance to a lot more diffuse appearance. And you can imagine this is someone who's probably going to end up in the ICU and possibly need mechanical ventilation. So to summarize, imaging findings of COVID-19 are um, typical of an organizing pneumonia pattern of lung injury. And we see this with many things, as I mentioned, drug toxicity, as well as connective tissues, these are by far the most common. And depending on when symptoms have started, it's gonna affect the imaging appearances. And of course, you can still have a normal imaging study even if your PCR is positive. But the longer out you are from the symptoms, the more likely you're gonna have some imaging findings. And I just wanted to mention, these are hot off the press as of about 20 minutes ago, um, and should be available both on the journal chest as well as the journal radiology. The role of chest imaging in patient management during the COVID-19 pandemic um, uh, it's a statement from the Fleischner Society there. And uh, you know, um, there's a couple of things, scenarios we address, but you can see imaging is not indicated in patients with suspected COVID-19 and mild clinical features unless they are at risk at, for disease progression. And uh, you can look at these today on your own and see what uh, came from these. So finally, which patient has COVID-19? All these patients have organizing pneumonia patterns on their CTs, some are more extensive than others. Turns out it's the lower right corner this time. We have a bleomycin toxicity, uh, an EVA uh, which we're not seeing really much anymore, from vaping, an influenza A, which I saw two weeks ago, and a COVID-19. So if any questions or comments, feel free to reach out to me either on Twitter or via email. And thank you for your attention, and thank you, Hart, for putting this together. Thank you, Jeff. We will now pass over um, control of the slides to uh, Dr. Kazaruni. Uh, we appreciate so much, again, uh, your dedication um, to this project and, and our field in general. Uh, thanks so much as I tried to work out my uh, Zoom IT connection here this morning, but I'm so pleased to be with you all today and uh, start with a little bit of the COVID-19 background through the chest X-ray. and. Really enjoyed watching uh, Jeff's presentation on uh, chest CT and some of the national guidelines as they're evolving. Let's see, advance the slide, there we go. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit from the beginning of the pandemic, what the timeline has been, uh, reinforce some of the information about clinical presentation and how COVID-19 is transmitted, uh, what the current state of testing and diagnosis is for COVID-19, review the imaging guidelines and talk about the imaging findings as they relate specifically to chest X-ray. So this is an overview of the COVID-19 timeline beginning from the World Health Organization, the top left report from the Chinese, about 41 patients with a mysterious pneumonia. Uh, these cases may have been uh, present as early as uh, mid to late November. Uh, it was very quickly after that time point that they closed the famous one on seafood mar uh, wholesale markets. Um, within about a week, the Chinese had identified a novel coronavirus, and not long after that had the first death in China on January 11. The first spread outside China was to Thailand January 13. The first case here in the United States was January 20th in the state of Washington. And then we started to see a series of public health measures evolve. Uh, quarantines happening in Wuhan and then Hebei province. Uh, the World Health Organization on January 30th declaring a public health emergency. We started to see the first death outside China, which is believed to have been in the Philippines at the very beginning of February. January 31st, the US imposed its US-China travel ban. We started to see the death toll spiking in China in uh, beginning to mid-February, at which time their death toll had exceeded the prior SARS epidemic. We started to see uh, large outbreaks in Iran, Italy in mid to late February. South Korea spikes at the same time. We begin to have national lockdowns in Italy. The first US death was at the end of January and we start to see on the same day, March 11th, the US uh, imposing a travel ban for Europe and the World Health Organization declaring a pandemic. And this was at a time where we evolved from 41 cases back on December 31st to uh, over 120,000 cases when the pandemic was declared. Worldwide, and this was updated uh, this morning, 
uh, 1.36 million total confirmed cases of COVID-19 infection um, with sev nearly 76,000 deaths and close to 300,000 documented reported cases worldwide. And this is from the John Hopkins University tracker. Uh, you can certainly drill down on that tracker to uh, the national level approximately 370,000 confirmed cases in the United States and nearly 11,000 deaths. And I look back at having give a modified version of earlier, modified version of this presentation um, just a week earlier on February 30th, and the numbers were considerably lower, 143,000 cases in the U.S. and 2,500 deaths. And I also look at the data that comes out from the CDC, which was reported in from the states. Um, this is a heat map of concentrated areas being in the darkest orange to orange brown color. And if you look at that evolution of the map just over the last two weeks from March 24th to March 30th to April 7th, you can see the gradual filling and darkening of the U.S. in terms of the distribution and intensity of cases within the population. Um, this is a website that you might find interesting to look at, which is healthdata.org with respect to COVID-19. And you can drill down on the state level to the projected resources and spikes in your own area. Uh, nationally in the U.S., the spike is expected to be on about April 15th. The uh, shaded areas are the degrees of variance around the prediction. And as you watch these predictions over time, you start to see that the degrees of variance starts to narrow as the predictive models get better. And this was as of uh, this morning's data. Uh, this was just March 30th. So when people talk about the flattening of the curve, the same site access for US data on April 30th showed a much uh, taller spike of the curve. And now we're starting to see the flattening of the curve. And this is what has been discussed so much naturally about can we flatten the curve with public health measures? And it looks like we are having that impact nationally. Uh, you can also look at projections of deaths per day and deaths over time, and these are starting to get more and more refined um, over time. And the current projection is approximately 82,000 deaths using this particular model in the U.S. due to this pandemic, although this is subject to variation and depending on how public health control measures continue to be enforced and obeyed. And you can drill down into your states. This is um, for us, the University of Michigan, being in the state of Michigan, the projections from, April, from uh, March 30th, um, updated for this week, April 7th. You can see that our projections are definitely changing over time and the public health um, attention to hand hygiene, uh, voluntary wearing of masks and uh, staying within homes and only venturing out if absolutely necessary are the kinds of things that are helping have the impact on the curves and the projections. But I encourage you to look at this particular website, covid19.health.org, and you can look at projections in your own areas. I found this to be a particularly interesting historical throwback. Um, at the University of Michigan, we are about to embark on the deployment of a field hospital, 2020 field hospital with approximately 500 beds on our athletic campus um, at our new track stadium. And you can just see a schematic of uh, 500 beds sitting inside and over an indoor track facility. But if we look back to, um, should be 1914, apologies to the first contagion unit that we had here, across the country there were contagion units in the early 1900s. And many of the things today about hand hygiene, sterile techniques and other processes developed during the earlier contagion um, in the 19th century are still in use today. A little bit about transmission. A person-to-person -person direct close contact within six feet is the primary mechanism of transition. And that's why social distancing of approximately six feet is recommended. This is because respiratory droplets are produced when an infected person coughs, sneezes, or talks. And those droplets can land in the mouths or noses of people nearby and possibly be inhaled into the lungs. In addition, COVID-19 uh, virus may contaminate surfaces, particularly harder surfaces. And then when you touch those surfaces and then touch your hands, face, nose, and eyes, you can then be infected. That's why hand hygiene is so important. Washing hands with soap or water or using an alcohol-based hand rub. 
There has been some confusion about aerosolizing small particle performing procedures versus larger droplet procedures. And I urge you, if you have any concern uh, to understand the differences, to visit the CDC website. The contagious period is predominantly when people are symptomatic. That is when they have the highest viral load. But there is clearly some spread before symptoms develop, and we're seeing increase in the number of asymptomatic individuals undergoing testing. So now we have seen this week the voluntary recommendation for masks on when the community at large is in, in public. That means going to the grocery store, going to the gas station, wherever you are outside of your home, important to consider the voluntary recommendation for wearing a mask. How do people present with COVID-19? And this is information taken directly from the CDC website. It's very important to watch for symptoms, which typically appear two to 14 days after exposure. The symptoms are fever, cough, and very key in this infection, shortness of breath, and shortness of breath that may be developing rapidly. The CDC has put together an online uh, help aid where people can fill in their symptoms and communicate to identify whether they should be seeking medical care or somebody around them should be as an additional resource for people who may not have access to healthcare facilities or physicians. When should somebody seek medical attention? The emergency warning signs for COVID-19 requiring urgent medical attention include trouble breathing, persistent pain or pressure in the chest, new confusion or inability to rouse, and people who start to develop bluish lips or face due to hypoxia. This list is not intended to be all inclusive and people are certainly recommended to consult their physician if they have symptoms of concern. I'm gonna take a moment to review some of the things that you can do and these are important to you, your families, your communities, um, your loved ones. Um, cover your coughs and sneezes. Cover your mouth and nose with a tissue when you cough or sneeze. Throw used tissues away in a lined trash can and wash your hands. Clean your hands often, either with soap and water for 20 seconds, using hand sanitizer, and avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth with unwashed hands. Avoid sharing personal household items, particularly with other people who are symptomatic. And clean your high-touch surfaces every day, particularly if you have somebody in your household who may be sick. There are key times to wash your hands, which may be a little more often than what you think. These include before, during, and after preparing food, before you eat. Of course, before and after caring for someone who is sick, or before and after treating a cut or wound. Using the toilet, changing diapers, after blowing your nose, coughing or sneezing. But also consider washing your hands when you're touching an animal, feeding an animal, handling pet food or pet treats, and after touching your garbage. So much more often than we usually think about washing our hands. Now, how do we test for and diagnose coronavirus? The primary collection method used in the United States are nasopharyngeal swabs that go deep into the back of the nasal passage into the pharynx that is then put into some form of a transport media tube. These are then put through molecular reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction testing, what's become known as PCR. Initially, these tests were predominantly through the CDC and state health departments, but we have seen rapid development of testing through commercial and hospital labs that has been increasingly rolled out across the United States. The FDA approved its first point of care test on March 21st a rapid test that was developed by Abbott Laboratories and is a more contained desktop unit on March 27th, and self-collecting specimens are under development. Now, what testing you have depends on your hospital's ability to run tests, to contract with companies to run tests, to work with your health department, and to be able to obtain the correct specimen collection uh, materials. It's important to note that nasopharyngeal swabs are the most sensitive and to recognize that in the US, the tests that have been rolled out have very high analytic sensitivity, which is different than when you read the literature that has been published about COVID 
predominantly from China. Early in the epidemic, when testing was not very sensitive, it was common to see statements in radiology publications that say imaging can be abnormal in the face of a negative test. But if the tests themselves were not very sensitive, and we've seen quotes as low as only 30 to 50 percent sensitivity, you can see how a statement like that could be made until tests became more accurate. Serology tests are in rapid development by multiple commercial vendors to detect IgM and IgG antibodies in a patient who has been infected. Note these tests may be negative in the first few days of an infection. Currently investigational, accuracy and use cases are unclear, but they can give us a population level look at the prevalence of what, of what the disease has been in the community. The FDA did approve on April 1st, the first serological test. There we go. This is what the nasopharyngeal swab looks like. It goes deep through the nasal passage into the back of the pharynx. And this is what the testing kits look like. They can uh, consist of a medium in which to put the specimen and a nasopharyngeal swab. Now, there are many different types of PCR testing. Um, they're available for many companies. Some hospitals have developed their own in-house PCR testing. Uh, many others are using uh, commercially available tests from companies that can be high throughput and run faster or slightly longer uh, throughput. The fastest ones are best being used in emergency situations and for inpatient care. Uh, the slightly longer throughput are generally recommended for the ambulatory care setting where patients are less sick. People are discussing whether they can use other types of swabs. These have generally not been approved, such as swabbing the throat or swabbing just the nasal passage. You probably heard about the um, on-the-counter five-minute point-of-care Abbott test, which can run one test at a time. These are best designed for office-based testing scenarios or in settings where you're trying to look at healthcare workers and essential workers and see whether they can continue to work. Um, serologic testing, as I mentioned, there is an explosion under development and uh, use cases. I want to reinforce that the testing that is being rolled out in the United States has very high analytic sensitivity to detect down to very small numbers of virus detection copies per microliter. And this is very different than many of the tests that were used earlier during the months of January and early February, particularly abroad. Uh, why is X-ray and CT generally not recommended as a first line test? And these statements that I'm going to talk about are not only those from the American College of Radiology, but they have been reinforced by the Canadian equivalent of the ACR uh, organizations such as the Australian and New Zealand radiologic communities and today the Fleischner guidance. Well, the CDC recommends collecting and testing specimens from the respiratory tract as the way to diagnose COVID-19 infection. The CDC does currently not recommend chest X-ray or CT in the setting of screening or diagnosis. Viral testing is the only specific method of diagnosis and required if the chest X-ray is negative or positive, if the CT is negative or positive. So understanding why you're using the test is important. The findings on chest X-ray and CT are not specific and as Jeff Caney has showed you, the overlap with many other conditions, including other forms of viral pneumonias like influenza. Currently, we're still in our usual influenza season, and this limits the specificity of the findings that are seen. The ACR zone appropriateness criteria for acute respiratory illness states that chest CT is not usually appropriate, and a Cochrane database of systematic reviews on the use of chest X-rays in acute lower respiratory tract infection found no difference in patient outcomes whether chest x-rays were used or not in children and adults. There we go. So based on these concerns, the ACR recommends that CT should not be used to screen or as a first-line test to diagnose. 
and it should be sparingly reserved for hospitalized symptomatic patients with specific clinical indications, such as an acute and unexplained deterioration or suspicion of other coincident conditions such as acute pulmonary embolism. The ACR recommends the deployment of portable radiography units where possible in ambulatory care facilities to minimize the number of people coming into radiology suites, as radiology suites may have to, may, may have to sit unused for approximately 30 to 60 minutes in order to allow air to recirculate through the room sufficient times for infection control. But it is very important that radiologists familiarize themselves with the appearance on CT as Jeff has so kindly demonstrated today. The ACR does recommend that, has, ACR has um, recognized that in places where there has not been access to timely testing, people may have been using CT as a way to identify disease and make treatment decisions, but not because they were trying to use CT primarily because of a shortage of availability of testing for COVID-19. And as increased testing access becomes available across the United States, this should be less the case. The Society of Thoracic Radiology and the, uh, the uh, Emergency Radiology Society have put forth the same guidance. And the ACR, and you're probably seeing all of your hospitals, that the non-urgent outpatient radiology tests ranging from screening to all forms of imaging that are not essential and must be performed currently be deferred. And many radiology practices have seen a marked reduction in their current schedules um, down to as little as 10 to 20% of a normal uh, practice volume. I wanna to briefly touch on some of the medications that you may have been hearing about. And it's important to know that the FDA does not have any current approvals for the use of drugs in COVID-19. So these are currently considered off-label or investigational uses. We've heard a lot about remdesivir, which is investigational, intravenous, and inhibits viral replication. It is known to have in vitro activity against the SARS-CoV-2 virus and against other beta coronaviruses. And there are four ways to get it through ongoing trials and compassionate use in hospitalized patients. There's an expanded access program in the US under rapid development. And there are several um, national trials that are enrolling patients that are um, available for access to this drug, including a double blind placebo controlled trial of COVID-19 patients who have pneumonia and hypoxic adults who are not pregnant and who are either desaturating on room air or require supplemental oxygen or mechanical ventilation. And there are two phase three randomized open label trials as well uh, for adults. In addition to a compassionate use application. The other medications that are getting considerable attention are the hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. Uh, these are historically used for malaria and um, some college and vascular diseases, respectively, available by oral prescription. Uh, some states have had to uh, warn licensed physicians about uh, oral about prescribing these medications and stockpiling them for uh, potentially for family or friend use, and are watching people's prescribing habits and sending warnings to physicians about this. These drugs are used in conditions like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis and have known um, ability to work in those conditions. And there's uh, maybe shortages of, of availability for patients with other diseases. Uh, in vitro activity against the virus is known, particularly with hydroxychloroquine having a relatively higher potency. There is a potential safety concern of cardiotoxicity with prolonged use. Uh, particularly in patients with renal or hepatic failure and the possibility of immunosuppression. The clinical and virologic benefit to chloroquine treatment in COVID-19 patients uh, versus a comparison group um, has been shown in an early study in China. And currently hydroxychloroquine is under investigation in US clinical trials, not only for treating patients who have COVID-19 infection, but for pre-exposure and post-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, one of the largest trials is being run here with the primary site and the coordination site being Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit. But there are currently no randomized trial data 
available to guide use or dosing. For those of you interested in what's happening in drug development, there are a series of antivirals, anti-inflammatories, and antibody drugs being developed. Uh, the timeline for these drugs uh, to be tested, developed, and available runs through the end of summer, and multiple pharmaceutical companies are working on this front. Okay, to the chest x-ray. Um, one thing that I have to reinforce is that core inspiration due to shortness of breath may confound the detection or evaluation of severity due to atelectasis. Um, X-rays may be completely normal in the setting of COVID-19. Uh, there may, may be multifocal alveolar opacities that range from subtle to extensive, diffuse alveolar opacities, and then of course the type of appearance we see with ARDS in patients going on ECMO or extracorporeal life support. So a few examples, this is a 48 year old male with cough, dyspnea, and no fever, COVID positive by PCR and chest X-ray negative. This individual works in a group home where being COVID positive is uh, very meaningfully important in their ability to return to work. And in this case, uh, the patient was sent home from the emergency department for a two week quarantine, but have to be tested again before returning to work in that setting. Here's a COVID positive 39 year old woman with a chest X-ray. Uh, she presented a week earlier with fatigue, malaise, headache, dry cough, shortness of breath, and some GI symptoms. Um, she tested positive at an outside facility. Uh, three emergency to visit, department visits later because of her shortness of breath and anxiety. Um, she comes to our, back to the emergency department and now has um, some subtle ground glass type alveolar opacities, perhaps little patchy consolidation at the bases, but very hard in the setting of such a poor inspiration to identify whether this is hypoventilatory atelectasis or whether this is true uh, COVID um, alveolar disease. If we um, look back at her, at, if we look at her chest x-rays, they do develop a week later, we start to see Perry Heiler and Basler predominant consolidation. Again, not specific for COVID-19, consistent with in the appropriate clinical context. Um, she was eventually discharged home to quarantine, stable on room air, and was not saturating with walking. Here is another chest x-ray example, a uh, mimics interstitial edema. We look uh, in the periphery of the lungs, we can see what look like curly lines some patchy ground glass or alveolar type opacities, not very severe in overall extent. Uh, this patient presented with predominantly GI symptoms uh, the, and poor oral intake. The dyspnea was a secondary uh, symptom in this person. This patient was known COVID-19 viral pneumonia positive um, at an ambulatory care facility before coming to our emergency department. Um, desaturated to 85% with a pulse ox on room air and has been treated with uh, Plaquenil for five days prior to discharge from the hospital. And this was her x-ray at discharge, which had resolved. Um, here's another example of a COVID positive patient, low lung volumes. Again, hard to know, is this abnormal? or is there really some subtle ground glass? And I think, and consolidation, when we have a high pretest sensitivity based on questions, we tend to overcall what we see on x-rays. Now uh, this is, uh, so with a chest x-ray on February 23rd, this patient was three days into being COVID positive. Three days earlier, I don't think we would have called this abnormal, but if, as we progress in the disease, patients can then come to the emergency room in acute hypoxic respiratory failure. And that was the case in this individual. Eight days of fever, cough, myalgias, and diarrhea with dyspnea limiting activity, had three prior ED visits and x-rays with milder symptoms, and came to the ED in extremis with acute hypoxic respiratory failure requiring intubation, diffuse consolidation not specific for, but consistent with COVID-19. A milder example of some patchy consolidation, multifocal patchy consolidation, a 53-year-old woman with fever, cough, dyspnea, 
has a past medical history that includes lung disease in the form of asthma, making the person at slightly increased risk of COVID-19 pneumonia. And within day three, you can see much more extensive and more obvious multifocal consolidation. And again, I wanna stress consistent with, but not specific for COVID-19 pneumonia. Another individual, acute hypoxic respiratory failure, multifocal extensive consolidation in the setting of a positive COVID test is cons again, consistent with COVID pneumonia, but not specific for. 24 hours later, this patient's radiographic abnormalities had changed considerably. So we go from diffuse multifocal to predominantly basilar. And that makes you wonder how much of this was really true disease versus superimposed edema, particularly in patients who have heart disease. This, this case not only shows you the imaging pattern of diffuse kind of grainy alveolar ground glass and consolidated ab abnormality in this 81 year old with three days of fever, fatigue, cough, dyspnea, and near syncope, but also points out some of the social context this person, as an older individual, is 81. Life was also symptomatic with fever and cough in the home. They were trying to care for each other. And this individual decided they did not want um, intubation and, and they were and made themselves um, do not resuscitate. And these are some of the social contexts and ethical considerations and discussions that are happening with, with patients. This patient's radiographic abnormalities progressed uh, rapidly within one day. And then lastly, we'll see ARDS-like patterns. This patient was transferred into our institution, known COVID positive for an ECMO evaluation. Diffuse consolidation looks very similar to any ARDS-like pattern in an intubated patient, has pneumomediastinum along the heart borders, an extensive body wall air outlining the pectoralis muscles bilaterally. Uh, this patient uh, continued to deteriorate. This was two days after transfer in, a much more extensive subcutaneous emphysema, is then placed on ECMO, extracorporeal life support, develops one of the known complications of ECMO, which is a hemothorax, your extra pleural fluid that is accumulated on both sides, pushing the lungs inwards, as patients are required to be on anticoagulation when they're on an ECMO circuit. And over the last two days, the lungs have a densely consolidated, and this was the most re recent radiograph of densely consolidated lungs with no aeration. And it's been shown that individuals who maintain a radiographic appearance like this for 48 hours on ECMO have a very poor outcome. Um, two last cases that just point out some of the confounders. This was a young adult who came in with dry cough, dyspnea, and fever. We have one rounded patch of opacity. He was a medical transporter in close contact with patients. So the, the uh, concern was high because of potential exposures. This individual con, uh, was COVID negative. The abnormality was CT'd, had a, a one, one focus of abnormality. But young adults may have rounded pneumonia. And we believe this is what this is, a community acquired rounded pneumonia, not COVID, even though it's rounded. And let's not forget that pulmonary edema and COVID pneumonia that's diffuse can look the same. And this person has alveolar pulmonary edema with pleural effusions, has a history of cirrhosis, was admitted for dyspnea, and the abdominal CT evaluation, tremendous ascites, but one little rounded patch of ground glass opacity spiked concern for COVID. And this patient's CT rapidly progressed over a few days, and it looks not dissimilar to some of the images that Dr. Caney showed us of multifocal peripheral and rounded consolidative like abnormality. This person is COVID negative. Um, their ultimate diagnosis was fluid overload. Uh, the abnormality became more diffuse and confluent um, after response to aggressive diuresis and three paracentesis um, was doing much better discharged home. So even in the setting of something that looks just like what we think COVID may look like in CT, you can have confounders and this is pulmonary edema. Um, there's a number of radiology resources you can avail yourself from, uh, things that are on the CDC, the American College of Radiology website, as well as our major journals have collection of cases to review.
So thank you for allowing me to discuss the timeline of the pandemic, the clinical presentation and transmission and what you can do to stay safe, how we test for and diagnose COVID-19 infection and the appropriateness of imaging and in particular review the chest radiographic findings today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Kazaruni, Dr. Kaney. I do want to, um, in the Q&A, there was one question that was asked a, a few times by the attendees, and we, uh, if we can address, uh, maybe the two of you can make a comment on um, if there's a correlation between the severity of uh, either CT or chest X-ray findings and the prognosis of uh, COVID patients. Uh, do we know that information at this point? Can, can you clarify the question? I'm not quite sure I understand. Um, the imaging findings that we see on chest X-ray or CT at this point, do they correlate with the prognosis of the patients? I don't think we have enough uh, case series in the U.S. in particular. We certainly are seeing patients who look just like any form of acute alveolar damage in ARDS, in which case we have a better idea of natural history outside of COVID-19 pneumonia but we don't have COVID-19 specific data in the U.S. yet, I think, to really understand that. Yeah, so I was gonna, oh, I, go sorry, I was gonna add as well is that it, it, a lot of it has to do, depend on when you image, as Ella showed some nice cases, as, you know, and then what we saw from the early series from China is if you image early on in the course of the disease, you're gonna have few abnormalities, um, and patients who are not that ill may be discharged home. Whereas if you image in someone who presents in more distress, they may have more abnormalities. And the fact that they're already in distress may, may be associated with a worse prognosis, but it's unclear now. And um, we're not doing serial imaging of our patients. And there's those uh, Cochrane analyses that Ella alluded to as well um, that um, showed that there doesn't really affect outcome. Now, I'll just add to that, the lung only has so many ways to react to injury in terms of inflammation, cellular infiltration, and reaction. And if we, if we think about diffuse alveolar damage related to any etiology, in this case, COVID-19, the lung's reaction to it and uh, the way it progresses and appears when you get to end stage diffuse alveolar damage, uh, we have a good sense of what that looks like outside of COVID. We just don't have COVID-specific information. Thank you for those uh, answers. Uh, we sort of reached our limit in time uh, through the hour. I want uh, again to thank both Dr. Uh, Casaruni and Dr. Caney for their time and dedication for this series. Uh, I appreciate the attendees' participation and um, the attendees' uh, patience in some of the uh, challenges we had in uh, today's. Uh, we will make sure those uh, are rectified in the future and again, uh, we will be hosting all of the talks on the APDR YouTube channel, hopefully within the next few days. Clearly, there's some editing that needs to be done, and um, we will be posting those for uh, residents to view for free. So thank you all so much, uh, and we hope to see you again in the uh, next session, where, again, we'll have a day of chest uh, on Thursday with two new speakers. Thank you, Harp. Thank you, Ella. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Harp. Thanks, Carl. Take care, guys.